uh, Red Line, we're dedicating all the shows this week to looking at some of those speeches that have really uh, gone on to live and touch people's lives, influence policy, and of course, influence movements around the world. Here is Martin Luther King Jr. from Riverside Church, the war in Vietnam, uh, the most past important foreign policy speech ever given by a non-elected official in American history. Take a listen. Arthur Castro, Arthur Mao, as a faithful minister of this one, can I threaten them with death? Or must I not share with them my life? And finally, as I try to explain for you and for myself the road that leads from Montgomery to this place, I would have offered all that was most valid if I simply said that I must be true to my conviction that I share with all men the calling to be a son of the living God. Beyond the calling of race, a nation, a creed, is this vocation of sonship and brotherhood. Because I believe that the Father is deeply concerned, especially for his suffering and helpless and outcast children, I come tonight to speak for them. This I believe to be the privilege and the burden of all of us who deem ourselves bound by allegiances and loyalties which are broader and deeper than nationalism and which go beyond our nation's self-defined goals and positions. We are called to speak for the weak, for the voiceless, for the victims of our nation, and for those it calls enemy. For no document from human hands can make these humans any less our brothers. And as I ponder the madness of Vietnam, and such within myself for ways to understand and respond in compassion, my mind goes constantly to the people of that peninsula. I speak now not of the soldiers of each side, not of the ideologies of the Liberation Front, not of the hunting inside gone, but simply of the people who have been living under the curse of war for almost three continuous decades now. I think of them too, because it is clear to me that there will be no meaningful solution there until some attempt is made to know them and hear their broken cries. They must see Americans as strange liberators. The Vietnamese people proclaimed their own independence in 1945 after a combined French and Japanese occupation and before the communist revolution in China. They were led by Ho Chi Minh even though they quoted the American Declaration of Independence in their own document of freedom, we refused to recognize them. Instead, we decided to support France in its reconquest of a former colony. Our government felt then that the Vietnamese people were not ready for independence. And we again fell victim to the deadly Western arrogance that has poisoned the international atmosphere for so long. With that tragic decision, we rejected a revolutionary government seeking self-determination, and a government that had been established not by China, for whom the Vietnamese have no great love, but by clearly indigenous forces that included some communists. For the peasants, this new government meant real land reform one of the most important needs in their lives. For nine years following 1945, we denied the people of Vietnam the right of independence. For nine years, we vigorously supported the French in their abortive effort to recolonize Vietnam. Before the end of the war, we were meeting 80% of the French war costs even before the French were defeated at Dien Bien Phu, they began to despair of their reckless action, but we did not. We encouraged them with our huge financial and military supplies to continue the war even after they had lost the will. 
Soon we would be paying almost the full cost of this tragic attempt at recolonization. After the French were defeated, it looked as if independence and land reform would come again through the Geneva Agreement. But instead, there came the United States, determined that who should not unify the temporarily divided nation. And the peasants watched again as we supported one of the most vicious modern dictators, our chosen man, Premier Diem. The peasants watched and cringed as Diem ruthlessly rooted out all opposition supported bad extortionist landlords and refused even to discuss reunification with the North. The peasants watched as all this was presided over by United States influence and then by increasing numbers of United States troops who came to help quell the insurgency that Diem's methods had aroused. When Diem was... It's interesting, uh, Dr. King, in the war in Vietnam, and I'm, uh, I'm going to make sure you come to Ida's point, but just a quick, I want to veer mm -hmm. off quickly to this. Uh, Dr. King really sounding like a foreign policy guru, giving us a history of Vietnam, uh, its rise, uh, of course, the, uh, the support of the United States for, for, for a cruel dictator. And uh, that is a thread that has always, I think, that has lingered uh, in American foreign policy for a long time. We've seen uh, Augusto Pinochet in Chile. Uh, we've seen in Liberia, West Africa, Samuel Doe, another dictator who was supported by Reagan. So at every point in American history, uh, American chapter, there is always this insatiable appetite to support dictators who oppress their own people. And Dr. King, I think in this speech, uh, uh, Bill, finding solidarity with the poor in Vietnam. Well, what he's, what he's doing is in finding solidarity with them, he is pointing out the hypocrisy of the U.S. government's position and pointing out the hypocrisy of, of the United States. Here we lay claim to being a revolutionary government as a result of the Declaration of Independence and, and, and the U.S. Constitution, yet we find ourselves allied with dictators. In fact, in Vietnam, the dictator, No Dien Dim, was handpicked by the United States so that we had somebody that one we felt we could work with and we've seen that throughout the the, the last 60 or so years of the united states right. uh foreign policy Half a and century. dr king called it out and one of the problems we have today is there is nobody calling out the fact that we are doing that which is 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 opposed to the ideals that we lay claim to in both the Declaration of Independence and the U.S. Constitution. Indeed, we have a president today who is basically trying to become as authoritarian and autocratic as people like Diem, Pinochet, and others. Yeah, and uh, let's, let's uh, I just point on, on the technology question. Well, uh, the, the economic... Yeah, I want to come back to right. that because it was a great point that Ida raised. The right. fact of the matter is, is that this speech is about not only about peace but it's it's about if we had peace in vietnam the resources that we are devoting to fighting a war there we can then devote to economic development here at home that's what matters most because frankly if you are going to be a a a, a virtuous nation to the rest of the world take care of your people so that right. others can say oh we want to be like that yeah. they look after them and when it comes to technology, I just want to say I, I appreciate your particular group, but there are other groups in Detroit and in Michigan that are looking to invest in, 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 in technology uh, for our, our kids. And as the former uh, uh, chief information officer of Meyer, that was an effort that I supported and it was an effort that uh, I was involved in during my tenure as chief information officer at the Meyer Corporation. So I applaud you, and I just want you to know that we recognize that the economics is as important as the peace issue in this speech. Uh, let's go to uh, Bob. Bob has a question or comment. Uh, uh, deconstructing uh, Dr. King's speech uh, about the war in Vietnam. Well, what people still aren't going back farther in time is how 
the reason we were in Vietnam to begin with, when we seized a rubber plantation in 1940 under uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, which the dark side of our government never comes to light, and we're always rallying to the flag, and our deceitful ways are coming forth. And as he lays out, he, when you hear this man speak and the passion coming from his heart, you, you feel it over the radio. And when somebody speaks with that type of passion and his religious following um, is believed by many and our right to freedom of religion here is pointed out and the undermining of our government, it, Democrats or Republican, all you ever advocate is all the Democrats, but our school system is in shambles. We can't even teach our little kids how to read and write. We cannot get them into school. We don't have uh, two parents in the home, and everybody's advocating and coming to the to help to help get these children raised in school just to learn to read and write. They can find all the answers in the world if they just have basic reading skills. We do not do that. We, we sit here and ponder and say, it's everybody else's fault but my own. Who stepped up in the city of Detroit to complain about the mayor and that didn't end up in jail? Of people of I, 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 know, I know where you're going with this. I know where you're going. I'm going to stop the brakes right there. I know where you're going with this. Uh, it's that rugged individual in a very subtle way coming through. You're making your point, but I know where you're going with this. Right now, what we're talking about is the contradictions that is buried in the American democratic experiment, which is billions of dollars in foreign wars, while billions of dollars are siphoned away from the poor here in America. That it makes no sense that the richest, the richest country on this planet can afford to spend billions of dollars in foreign wars like the one in Iraq. You know, not even Vietnam, the one in Iraq, while millions of people go hungry every night. So don't tell me whose fault is that is. I know where you're going with that. I, I understand it. But let's put this in the right context right here, brother. You have a response. Where do you think the blame lays with your next-door neighbor? You feel the love, I, right? I, I, it, it's, it would be difficult for you to make the morality argument here, uh, abdicating, the abdicating or absolving the government of any responsibility. That's a difficult case to make, okay? I am not resolving the government. No, you're absolving. That's what you're trying to say because you're saying you're sitting here blaming the mayor, you're sitting here doing this. Come on, I can see through the point that you're trying to make. The mayor and nothing. I'm just pointing out our town has went from 1.8 million down to below 800,000. Okay. We have a million point one homes vacant. And do you, let me ask you this question. Let me ask you this question. Uh, do you believe that the city government has any responsibility whatsoever to map out an anti-poverty plan and address the structural inequities that are, that are so deeply pervasive in this city? Do you think the city government has a responsibility? Well, I've been on this earth over six no, years. No, I just asked you a question. Yes. Not, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not asking for the, for the length of your life experience. I just asked you a simple question. Do you believe that city government has a responsibility? Yes. Okay. All right. Case closed there. You made my point. Thank you so much. Uh, Bill